do what you do in the comfort of your own home, knowing that the things most precious to you are protected. Talk to the Nottingham Building Society today about a free home insurance review. Happy dancing! So, Billy, welcome to the show. How are you? Great. Thanks for having me on. Looking forward to getting to catch up. I know we've been trying to connect for a couple of weeks here. And like, as, as mentioned a minute ago, your year in Nottingham was probably one of the most eventful years in Panthers history, if, if we're being honest. Yeah, yeah it was awesome. Uh, winning the playoffs there to, to cap it off really uh, was something I'll never forget. Um, it was great. And winning the, uh, champ, the Champions League too was awesome. And also, you made the, the jump to Europe quite early in your career. You, you were drafted by the New York Rangers. Why did you make the jump this side after just two years in North America? I only played um, the year before I came over to Nottingham. I only played 12 games because I started having some hip, hip problems. So I only played, you know, those, leading up to uh, those three seasons. So my senior year in college, I only played half the games. I think my first year pro, I probably played, I don't know, under 30 games total. And then um, the, the second year pro, I only played 12 total games. So I kind of just needed a, a year to reset, um, get healthy. Um, you know, Corey Nielsen reached out to me and uh, just kind of wanted a place to really play and, and, and see if, how, if my body could even hold up. And uh, I was fortunate enough that the whole year went pretty smooth. You know, I didn't miss any games and uh, got to come back the following year um, to North America and play in the AHL. And, and it, was, it, was a, it was a great year for my development and went back to school uh, at the University of Derby. And, um, you know, was, I was really, really happy with the decision I made. And before we carry on, I will say that you have the most delightful accent that has been on this show. I've never had someone with that kind of Bostonian accent. So this is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hopefully you can understand me. Well, you can understand the Brit, so we're okay. <laughs> yeah, we're pretty similar, I think. So Cor Corey Nielsen is quite a character in himself. I've, I've spoken to many people who, when they first talked to him, they're not quite sure how to take him. How did you find Corey when you first met him? I liked him just because he was a hockey guy, you know, it was all, uh, everything was about hockey and, I don't. I, I didn't really have many conversations that were weren't about hockey, but that's kind of how I like uh, my coaches to be. So I mean, every time we walked into the rink, he'd really just pull me in and would talk about you know the power play or uh, some face-off play that he thought about the night before when he was in bed or something crazy. So um, I, I really liked him. I got along great with him. Can you still? What's that? I said, can you still remember all of his face-off plays? <laughs> I remember a lot of them. I actually, he was a mastermind with that type of stuff. I, I tried when I got into coaching, I actually like tried to remember all the ones that we did. And I have a, I have a lot of video of uh, the Nottingham games. Uh, I was watching them a couple of years ago. And then when you, when you come over, what did you know about hockey in the UK when you, when you came over? I didn't know much, to be honest. I was just coming over just to find a league where I could to stay healthy and uh, when, when the school package thing came around, I always took my education really serious as well. So um, I started looking into Nottingham and saw some of the past players at some uh, past NHLers that were on the team. Uh, so I knew it was probably a pretty good league. And Corey seemed like a pretty stand-up guy. Uh, I had a lot of mutual connections with him. Um, yeah, so I kind of just came. I knew a couple kids. Dustin Sprout was coming over. I, know, I knew Rob Bellamy was thinking about coming over at that time. Um, some other kids from North America that I've played against in the past, whether it was in college, were playing in the league that were all that were good players. So um, I didn't know much, but I was, I was actually happy with the level of play, and um, definitely the fans and around the league it was great. Now, when you get when you get to Nottingham itself, you say, what were your first impressions of of the city? Because Nottingham's one of those places that feels bigger than it actually is when you're inside it. Yeah, it was uh, the the place was buzzing really. Like I remember just coming out of the rink and having the rink downtown was such a positive. Uh, some of the guys that were living downtown, we lived right on the outskirts, but um, yeah, I loved it with the, you know, the, you could do everything. The nice restaurants, the pubs, the movie theater. Um, yeah, it was all the nice stores down downtown and around Christmas time. They they really do it up nice down the center there. So. I was I was very very impressed. I, I didn't really know a place like that existed, and um, you know, but it was a place that 
I, I didn't really feel like I ever wanted to leave uh, to go even to go in downtown London because it felt like Nottingham had everything that I needed. And then when you when you get there, well, you get to see the arena, you get to lay your eyes on the arena for the first time. Did that surprise you at all the sides of it? Yeah, I think the the arena surprised me, but definitely the fans. I think I was even more surprised just how passionate they were. And um, you know, what's the arena hold? They're like seven and a half, about. Yes, yes. So it's just seeing that you know it was sold out pretty much almost every game when I was there. I don't know whether it's because we had a good team or what, but and the pet the the passion the fans have is really second to none. And I went to a college where uh, at the University of Maine where we you know arguably have the best fan base um, out of any NCAA team and you know seeing Nottingham's fan base it's right up there with them so it was, it was great really great people and a great community and um, just very very passionate and then when you get in there and involved in it then you get so you get there and you see the arena you get to experience the fans. then you get to experience the fans in games against Sheffield yeah. how, how much does that amplify things for for the players when, when you see that environment <laughs> Yeah, and then you go go to Sheffield, and it's you, know, you get people spitting at you and everything else. Um, yeah, no, it was awesome. Like I said, it, I came from a place. Some I was fortunate enough at college to get some big time rivalries. Uh, you know, whether it was you know Maine first BU or B, Boston College, got Boston University. So I like those type of atmosphere. Uh, but Nottingham Sheffield, that was definitely um, that was a, it was a rough rough and tough crew to. Uh, go against every game and there's always a lot of fights on the ice and I think off the ice and the fans as well. And not all the arenas in the Elite League are like Nottingham and Sheffield. You, have, you do have, you played when Whitley Bay was still around. You, so you've gone to Newcastle to play there. How did you yeah. find rinks like that? Because they are, I'll call them an experience. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, going to some of those rinks kind of shot at the confidence just because it was like uh, being back in high school almost with you know not a lot of fans and um, but there was only a, there was only a couple of those. For the, the most part, the rinks were really nice, like the Belfast, Sheffield, um, Cardiff. Well, they didn't get their new rink yet, but they always packed that barn pretty good. Uh, but yeah, those old rinks, oof, there was bad ice, uh, little fans, and I think that's when like the, it was the most fights would happen in those games too, just because I think everyone was so pissed off that we were actually playing in the, on small sheets of ice like that. You mentioned, have you ever played on a, on a tougher team than that one was at the start of the year? You know, with guys like Alex Penner, Gilepin, and then Rob Bellamy comes in. That, that, that team was very rough around the edges, I'll say. Yeah, no, I've never. Uh, yeah, I mean, no, I don't think I've played on a tougher team. Even even the guy, the middleweight guys, like the Steve Lee, it was, you could go right down the lineup. Danny Myers, uh, Matt, uh, everyone that, there was so many guys that would just be fighting every game. It was, I remember the bench clearing brawl. Uh, and Coventry, that was that was, that was crazy. <laughs> I've, got, I've never I've, seen anything like that. I've got that on my pad. We're going to get to that in a bit of detail <laughs> as we go along. <laughs> and obviously, that that year you start with a the big first league game was at home against Belfast. It's this crazy game that goes to a shooter. You know, Jay Galbraith scores that goal, gets disallowed, then they re he does it does his celebration. Yeah. The thing after like, Jade is a very mercurial player. Have you ever seen anyone with as much natural skill as he had? Yeah, he was he was really skilled, like a super intelligent on the ice, uh, just like a brilliant when he had the puck on his stick. Um, yeah, I mean he was he was definitely in the top tier of of guys I've played with with that high end hockey IQ, um, ability to make plays, score goals. His deception uh, when the puck was on his stick was was something that I always will remember. And he's a guy in the locker room, like if he saw something that you could have done better, he'd, he'd tell you. And um, it worked a lot. Of, a lot of times it, it really, uh, you know, you, you take a little tip from him here and there and then apply it the next period. Next thing you know, you're getting a goal or you're creating a play to set up a, a goal. So, yeah, he was, he was definitely, as far as skill and uh, natural talent, uh, one of the better players I've ever played with. And you mentioned guys like Steve Lee and Danny Myers, and you also got like David Clark in that list, Matthew Myers. How important are those British guys to helping you, you guys who are new to the league, you know, get used to everything? Yeah, they were, they were such good guys. They were so so welcoming, and it was just fortunate that uh, Corey put together such a good core of guys that you come in, and it, it was definitely one of the closest teams, maybe the closest team I've ever been on as far as guys' relationships and just good 
good solid people that um, cared about each other and would do anything for one another to help each other out. Um, yeah, just, you know, even the younger Brits like Robert Lackowitz, he was, he was really young then, but he was such a, such a good guy. And I lived with Steve Lee for the first couple of weeks until I could find an apartment and did welcome you right into their house and, you know, introduce you to their families. Uh, Danny Myers was great at that. And David Clark, it was just awesome to uh, have those guys and it was, you know, get to build lifelong relationships with them. And how, how was, cause you, you played a big part in getting Rob over into that team. How did you, what did you say to him to make it, because you'd obviously been there a couple of, a month or so. How did you get Rob Ellie to make the jump to Nottingham? Yeah, I just told him how, uh, you know, this is a great place to play, a good, good, uh, would, would be able to play together, a good group of guys, a uh, good coach that let, would let us play. And uh, we, and he wanted to do the school. I know he wanted to do the schooling too. So uh, just, he, he had a couple tryouts in the AHL and things weren't, he, I don't think he was, he had a definite answer on where he was going to be playing. So he took my word for it. I said, you could leave if you don't like it. And uh, I know that was one of the best decisions he's ever made as well. He loved it. He, you, he really loved it. He took it in. What did you think when he put um, Bruce Richardson through the glass hill up in Glasgow? <laughs> I forgot about that one. Yeah. Oh my God. Had you ever yeah, seen he, anything I've like seen that him do that. I, I grew up with him, so that wasn't the first time I've seen him do that. But uh, oof, that was yeah, I remember that was a that was a big one. And how did you find the like you know the, the schedule in the elite league is very different to North America, where you know you play a lot of games at the weekend and you have a lot of time in the week to yourself, sort of thing. How did you find that adjustment? Yeah, I just thought it was just the same as like I was when I was going to school at the University of Maine, where you know Monday through Friday I was driving to the University of Derby pretty much, you know, practice in the morning. And then I'd go off till about four or five o'clock uh, over to that campus, which I thought it was a little closer than it was. Uh, so I'd, I'd be stuck over there for a while during the week. And then, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday would just be gearing up for games. And, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of Saturday, a lot of you write a lot of Saturday, Sunday games and driving after games and, the road trips were always fun just because it was a good group of guys. Uh, then back to Monday, we went back to work and, and went back to school. So it was actually, it was, it was, I, I kind of liked that schedule. I think back then as well, you were still doing the, the three games in three, three nights up in Scotland. So when you went up there, that's, that must be tough on the body. <laughs> yeah, we didn't. Yeah, I, I don't, those, those trips were just kind of so far, so long ago, I kind of forget, but. Um, you know, there's those that group of guy like guys like to have their fun. So uh, we'd always go out for a couple beers after the game and try to keep it away from Corey, not not telling him what our plans were. So, but we'd always sneak out here and there. And what one of the bigger teammates you had that year it was his first year in Nottingham Wales was Craig Kowalski, and obviously he his legend since then in Nottingham is set. He he is a Panthers you know, in Panthers folklore. Could you tell early on that he was a special netminder? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. He, um, you know, he was, he was a good in the AHL and East coast league. And I remember, I think he was a black ace for Carolina when they won it, uh, won the Stanley cup, if I re recall correctly. Um, yeah, he was just, he was, he was on the smaller side, but he was a thick kid. He's great taking away angles. Um, very quick for his, you know, quick athletic, uh, again, a high hockey IQ. He anticipated the play so well at going East West with so many backdoor saves he made that should have been goals um and then he was always really good in the shootouts like he could he read the player's blade really well he when you'd open it up on him he'd, he'd be ready for the shot or if you were ready for to deke him one way or the other he'd be there waiting for you so uh very special in net a uh, highly competitive kid very focused motivated uh the type of kid you win with really so uh in all the big games he outplayed the other goalie and then unfortunately you meant you touched on it a few minutes ago he got injured in that bench clearing brawl in Coventry. Now that bench clearing brawl in Coventry, from what, what, from your memory, how did that all come together during the game? And were you on the ice? Were you on the bench when it all, when their guy ran K wall? Like, what, how, what was your memory? Of, what is your memory of that incident? <laughs> I was on the bench. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't on the ice. I don't think. Yeah, I was on the bench because I was the first. Yeah, because uh, Bell's. I think Bell's was the first guy. Bellamy was the first guy that jumped over the bench. So that. And he was next to me. Um, yeah, I just remember the whistle blew and the, the player went back to kill her. 
instead of going to the box, I think he went back and punched him in the head or something. And then uh, stuff hit the fan. And then one guy jumped over. And next thing you know, both teams were uh, on the ice. And there was about four. Was, the refs didn't really know what to do. There's so many fights going on that he couldn't, they couldn't focus on all of them. So I think I just got tied up with someone and just, there was just fights to my left, to my right, behind me. And I was just making sure that I didn't get two on one or I think the kid that I had didn't want to fight. So I just, the water was just like front row seat, just watching four or five fights and it didn't stop for a long time. Do, do you remember Alex being in the corner with his shirt off fighting two guys at the same yeah. time? <laughs> he was, that kid was legit heavyweight, NHL heavyweight tough. Like he was, uh, yeah, I've been, I've been working the NHL now for a long time and played in the AHL and East Coast League. And he was as tough as they come, that kid. And then that, when K-Wall went down, that kind of derailed things a little bit. Because, you know, Kevin St. Pierre came back in. He, he hadn't been playing. He played for Panthers the previous year. But that's when things started to unravel a bit and the, and the league kind of got away from the team, wasn't it? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, the killer was just, he was just such a big part of our team, you know. Like, he was, he was kind of quiet, quiet, smaller guy. So, I think at the time, people, he wasn't getting as much uh, recognition as he should have. But once he went down, he, people realized that, you know, he was probably the MVP of the team. Uh, he was our most most important player, um, the backbone of the team every night and showed up and really just played really solid every night. And then losing him was, you know, we, we went on a little slide there and uh, we had to make some some changes. Corey was forced to cut a couple guys to try to get everyone on the same page. Um, and he made all the right moves. And then once the end of the year started inching closer we kind of caught caught our wind again we got our swagger back and with having him in net everyone's confidence really uh came back and we came together how easy is it for for someone from north america to come and get their mind around that the league is the big trophy in the uk because no one ever seems to find that easy <laughs> yeah i know yeah it's definitely um it's really different you know like even guys would be telling me that and i i would just yeah, kind of like shake it off. Like, don't worry about it. It's not, it's not important, but to, to those guys, it really was important, you know? And, um, you know, I just focused on the, you know, just winning the playoffs mostly. And, you know, cause the league, you can be out of the, you can be out of it early, but if, if the playoffs, as long as you're, you're in the mix, you can win it in the end. And I always just thought about winning your last game. And if you win, if you win your last game, then you're the champion. Um, but yeah, the league, those guys take the league so serious and I felt bad that we didn't get to win the league, but I was good to win the playoffs and, uh, the other tournament, what's the other tournament? The called? challenge cup. Challenge cup. Yeah. The, the challenge cup and the, the two out of three was good. Uh, two trophies. And I think they did, they won the three, they went three for three. I think the following yeah, year. Yeah. They went, went two for two, uh, two for three, two for three, three for three. Yeah. So you, yeah, you, absolutely. you guys were kind of at the, the start of the Renaissance. Yeah. The, the trophy winning and stuff it started up yeah but a, a lot of the time that early on especially when, when rob came in, you guys were playing a lot with david alexander beauregard now how much did you learn from a guy like that yeah he just knew where to go on the ice you know obviously everyone knows he had that terrible eye accident where he was blind in one eye uh but he never let that derail him from how hard he worked every single game and it's almost like if he just program uh the way he played and that's how you that's how you score goals you really just go to the net hard and he found pucks around the net and just slammed them home he had a great shot um you know i i always used to say like how good were you when before the eye injury you know like he's a big strong kid who had a lot of skill and um you know he just had a knack around the net and uh i remember his brother was really good too um yeah, i played against him in the east coast league and, and with him for a little bit but uh, yeah, I think they're, they're just a good hockey family with with good genetics. And then when you see him score a goal, and at that point, I think he would have been about 34 years old. When you see him score a goal and celebrate the way that he does, how infectious is that to, to a bench and to his line mates? Yeah, that was awesome. Um, I think that was to win the game, wasn't it? He, did he get the game-winning goal? Oh, in the playoff finally did, yeah. <laughs> yeah, playoff finally got that game-winning goal, yeah. Yeah, it was awesome. Um, just he, he couldn't be a better guy either. He's an awesome guy. And uh, to see how happy he was, you know, he knew his career was kind of starting to come to an end there. And 
Uh, he, he was a kid who wore, wore his emotion on, on his sleeve. So uh, whenever he was pumped up, the whole team would get behind him and, you know, just be really happy for him. And you mentioned that, that obviously Corey was forced into making changes and things. Where it all came to a head was that loss in Newcastle. That seemed to be the, the, the breaking point for everything because that was a ring you were supposed to go to and you were not supposed to go and lose up there. What do you remember about like, the conversations that were had after that? Because I, I don't imagine they were overly pleasant <laughs> if, if, I, if reports I've heard are correct. No, that was really – that was – that was uh, I remember that was one of the more embarrassing losses uh, that I've ever had in my career. And it was one of those times you had to look yourself in the mirror. Uh, we knew that we shouldn't have lost that game with the talent we had in our room. And uh, Corey really let us know after that game. And, you know, he said that there's going to be changes because we're not, we're not performing the way that he thought we were. And uh, it was, you know, he, he took a lot of blame too. He just said that maybe, you know, we weren't preparing well or, uh, but he, he, the effort wasn't there. And that was the biggest thing for him. Um, you know, we kind of just let that team have a win that it was an important win too. I remember at the time. So uh, we came back that next week and a lot of guys were let go. and. Uh, you know, you're looking back at it, it was tough to see your friends, some guys you get close with, uh, get let go. But, um, you know, for, for the end goal, he definitely made the right decision. And obviously in that reshuffle, you end up playing with Robert Lakovic as well as, well as Rob Bellamy. And obviously Lakovic's at the start of his career there. How did you find playing with him? Because I know from speaking to him before, like you two taking him under his wing played a big part in his development. Yeah, I loved him. I loved him as a guy. I thought he was... Uh, he was, he had a quiet confidence about him, you know, like he's kind of late, he's a laid back guy, but when, when he's on the ice, he, uh, he likes to make plays. He's fast. He's aggressive, uh, highly skilled, uh, just a really good kid. So he was a kid. He kind of like re reminded me a little of myself when I was like 18 years old where, uh, you know, like he, he wasn't the biggest kid, but he, he could, he had a brain for the game and, uh, wasn't shy to, to, you know, make plays or, uh, and it seemed like the bigger the game was, the, the, the better he played. So he was a great fit with uh, Bells and I. And I know we, uh, we were really, we, were, we felt fortunate enough to have him on our line. Like he was just coming into his own. And I, I remember talking to Bells, like this kid's legit. Like he should, he should go back over to North America and give it a whirl over there. Because he, he was, for how young he was, he was, he was really good. And he was impressive. And uh, he was just another great guy on the team. And then two of the big additions that Corey made were Daniel Kachuk and Jeff Harima. And obviously, they had massive NHL experience behind them. But how much did their experience help with, you know, turning the team around ahead of the Challenge Cup? Yeah, they were great guys. They were really uh, professional. And, uh, you know, obviously, anytime you bring in two guys that they were both first-round draft picks, uh, they both played in the NHL both Hockey Canada, like world junior type players. So they were high, high profile guys. So you bring them in and just a lot of leadership and experience. And, you know, any game that we were down, we never really felt like we were out or the game was over. Uh, you get guys like that, that, you know, can score any shift and you got, uh, you know, the rest of the team that you believed, you know, how good they were each. So uh, having them around were awesome. Just, you know, they provide a lot of experience, uh, great guys. Uh, on you know on and off the ice it's very professional hard-working guys that kind of like came in at the right time just to get everything back on track and it worked and then the challenge cup is the first trophy that comes around that year now the challenge was a very interesting competition because it's a competition within a competition which was that easy to get your head around at first uh yeah i, I like that just because uh, you know anytime you get to lift an additional trophy uh, during the season, it, it gives you a little extra motivation. You know, sometimes during the season, stuff can get drawn out, but all of a sudden it's a Challenge Cup game, so you, you amp it up a little bit more. And um, you know, going into like a place like Belfast, that uh, was that was definitely uh, one of those games that you'll never forget. Um, winning that, winning it there, and getting to go out with all the guys after the game and celebrate the trophy uh, it was a lot, a lot of fun. I was say there's worse places to win a trophy than Belfast. <laughs> no, it was, it was like a perfect storm. You know, we, they were they were a great team too, and we got to uh, win it win it in their in their building, and then go celebrate in their city. Um, yeah, it was fun. And then, do you remember how many breakaways Rob had in that game to try and seal it, and just couldn't <laughs> score one? <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. I remember a lot of those breakaways and, uh, you know, he, he, were, he was so fast, you know, and on those big sheets of ice uh, playing with him, it was almost like playing soccer. I could just put the, put the puck in an area and let him skate into it. Uh, mm -hmm. Those area passes, me and him kind of would work on and watch a lot of video. So I went, once I saw him get the, get the motor going on the wing, I could just put the puck in the right place and send him in. But scoring was a little – didn't come natural for him. The, the one thing I remember you two did that I'd never seen before is he'd go down the middle and you like, lob the defenders. I'd yeah. never seen that before. <laughs> yeah, that was the old uh, – yeah, the, the flip it over the defender's head and just have it land at the far blue line and, and hit skate into it. Yeah, that was, there was a lot of little plays like that. It's like – you could do a little saucer pass behind the D and just area passes, you know? And I think that uh, when you have chemistry with someone, you know, we've played, we've played together for so long at that point. We've, I mean, we, we were playing together we, you know, before when I was in high school, making these all-star teams in the summers. And um, then with four years at Maine and then he signed, we both signed in Philadelphia. Uh, so, you know, it's a lot of years, six, seven years right there on the same team. And, not always on the same line, but when you, when you know someone, how they, their brain operates and he, he, he knew how my brain operated too. So it was just a, it was great to, you know, I wish we could have played together on, on teams after that too. And obviously that, that, that little chip play wouldn't work somewhere like Hull when the ceiling was about as low as yours is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. With this disco ball right in the middle. Hull was, a, Hull was another one that was an experience. <laughs> Hull was probably the, Biggest one, just walking out, because you'd have to walk through all the fans. Yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, a lot of the fans, like, had no teeth, and they'd be screaming at you, and the spit <laughs> would be hitting you. And those games got ugly, too. I remember Bells caused almost a, 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 a brawl there. He hit he hit there. He hit someone on that team. Drew Bannister, I think he absolutely labeled when uh, – it was an icing call and the whistle blew and bells didn't hear the whistle and the whole place went crazy and we were getting off the ice and people were trying to get after Bellamy and the police were getting involved. And, um, yeah, there's a lot of funny stories like that. And then well, one of the things that happened, like, you know, after the, the, the incident in Coventry and all the results went wrong is that Davy Graham, who was the assistant coach at the start of the year, he left, but Rick Strachan came in. who would obviously been around the elite league for years. What did, what did Rick Strachan bring to that locker room to help, you know, stabilize things? Yeah, he was great. He was, uh, he'll know, tell he you how it of, is. What's that? He'll tell you how it is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He was, he's a real honest guy. Um, but treated everyone with a lot of respect too. But you know, like you, he was a type of guy that you, you weren't, you couldn't talk back to because he was going to be, uh, he'd give it back to you, but he, he saw the game in a, in a good way. And, um, you know, he was, he was, he was really good just having that experience and, um, he knew the league really like the back of his hand and knew different players on the other teams and what some of their tendencies were as players and how the other coaches coached. Uh, he had a great mind for it. I think that, like you said, his uh, experience around the league really, really paid off and helped us during the stretch run. And then after you win that, that Challenge Cup, that's your first you know, championship as a player. How much does that mean to you when you finally get to lift the trophy? The chat, that was awesome. That was, uh, I think that just kind of set us up, got us even more hungry to keep winning, you know, like we had that little slide. So we knew we weren't going to win the, the league, but um, just celebrating together and, and putting in that hard work and buying in and playing the right way. I think that our team knew how to win big games, you know, like it was one of those teams, guys would block shots, guys would take a hit to make a play, guys would give hits and, and fight when we needed momentum. Um, and the, in, in big games, you need those, those type of players. And, and every person uh, bought in, bought in. And uh, like in a big game, I don't think there was many teams. I don't think there wasn't many teams in that league that would have beat us that year. And as the season rolls on towards those end of season playoffs, what are you getting told about this playoff finals weekend? Because it's so different to the only thing I've ever heard it compared to is the frozen four. Yeah. But what are you getting told about it as you're building up to it? Yeah, they just said it was the city was going to be crazy. Um, you know, like all, the, all the, the fans from around the league, and definitely the four teams that are in the in the weekend, the playoff weekend. But they just said that just be ready for the, the you know they're going to do a firework show and have all the the flames going before, and 
uh, like when you score, the the roof will go off, and you know they kind of just everyone just kind of we we had that tight little locker room, and everyone was just in it for each other, and whatever happens out there happens. But we we knew how we knew what we had to do to win the game. And you couldn't have had a tougher road to winning the playoffs, having to go against Sheffield, who just won the league, and then against Cardiff, who'd set all kinds of records for you know games won in a row after they brought in. Um, Oh, the, the defenseman, I can't remember what his name is now. Uh, Weller? Well, Craig Weller. Yeah they, yeah, they brought him in. So you're going against Sheffield in the semi final. Obviously, half the crowd's booing you, half the crowd's cheering you, which is a different experience to begin with in Nottingham. But um, what, what, what was the team's mindset going into that game against Sheffield? Obviously, because they had the better of the season series. So I imagine you wanted to make a, a point against them. Yeah, I think we were, like I said, we were kind of just kind of, you know, we brought in a couple of guys for the playoff run there and we, we felt like we had a new team, you know, we had a, we had a lot of confidence and uh, we were just so tight knit, you know, and, and then we, we really got the, now we got the home ice advantage, you know, so it's not, it's not really fair, even though half the fans are rooting for you and the other half's rooting against you, but uh, when it when it's your building, it's your building, and we felt very good, you know, on that ice. And uh, you know, guys remember coming out of that locker room, and guys were very confident and feeling good about their game. And you know, in those games, we, we'd get down, and we'd always find a way to get back up. And uh, we had a lot of leadership and experience. And you know, credit to Corey Nielsen, he he really put together a, a winning team. And in that semi-final, had you ever seen anyone hit a puck as hard as Jeff Harima hit that one time? <laughs> That's why he was drafted with 12th overall or wherever he was. Yeah, he, uh, the kid could shoot. He had, a, he had an unbelievable shot, and that's why he scored so many goals in junior and uh, was you know, played for, drafted by Carolina, and I think he played for a couple NHL teams. So, um, yeah, he had a deadly, deadly one-timer. And then obviously you mentioned that like, you and Robert t- taking Laco under your wing a little bit. So how, much, how happy did you, were you for him that he scored that overtime winner against them? Oh yeah, we were uh, we were pumped, you know. Like he has, he he was he was a really talented kid, and like you know, like he's mentioned before, he was he was just starting out his pro career, and to see a young kid contribute like that um, was awesome. And it was I couldn't have been happier for him, and I knew that the future was just going to be so bright for him and in GB hockey, that, you know, having a kid like that coming through the ranks. And then no rest for the wicked. You win that game. You got to look, a game to look forward to against Cardiff the next day. Your boy, like, and that game against Sheffield was a war. You must have been in pieces going into that game. <laughs> yeah, you just got the momentum, and you know it's it's uh it's the last game of the year, and you just got to try to do whatever you can to win that. You know, it's like a game seven. You don't really uh, think about how your body's failing or anything. You just gotta you, you want to win that game more than anything and cap off a great season. And uh, that that final game was. Well, there was a lot of uh, moment, momentum swings. And I, I remember being down going in the third period and everyone just kind of just kept buying in and we were going to work on it and shift by shift, get the lead back and, and win the game. And we did. I think, I think for everyone outside of the Cardiff Devils fan base, that may be one of the greatest playoff finals of all time. Like you said, with momentum shifts, they go two up, we score one, tie it up, they go back ahead. And then in the third period, Rob Bellamy lays the puck off to you and in our side of the neutral zone, you get the puck. Talk me through it. On the goal? That's the one. <laughs> it was, uh, no, it was Danny Myers. Oh, was Danny it da- Myers. Oh, Rob, yeah. I think Rob took credit for it when I spoke to him. Oh, yeah, he probably tried to take credit. No, <laughs> Danny Myers, uh, he made a great pass. He kind of faked like he was going to chip it off the wall, and instead he caught me in the middle, like a, at the blue line. And, um, I was, had some good speed going, and I just remember just thinking in my head, uh, I, was, I, I remember the goalie was kind of small, so I, I had enough speed where I wanted to get close to the goalie, so if the D was going to gap up on me, I was going to try to go around him uh, wide, or if he was going to give me more space, I was going to back the D up into the goalie and then shoot it. Um, and I, I just I, – I, I missed a couple earlier in the game. I uh, missed the net, but I remember – uh, over his shoulder was so open uh, I, in the locker room. I was like scratching my head, like, how did I miss that? How did I miss that? So this time I remember when I had the puck, I just, I was just reading the D how, how much room he was going to give me to, 
to go over his shoulder. And then uh, when I put my head up, I, I did like a little fake, I remember, to the left. And the goalie already started going down a little bit. And I was just, I was just thinking, there's no way I'm missing it this time. So I put the puck over his shoulder and the, the place went crazy. Oh, and when that puck is in it, do you like just black out in the moment? Or, or are you able to embrace what's just happened when you score a goal like that in a game like that? Yeah, I don't think I've have scored a goal like that uh, where the, the, the stadium felt like it was shaking like that, you know, like it was, so it was pretty, it was definitely memorable um, just how, how the fans just erupted, um, you know, something that you dream about kind of, but no, I've never scored a goal. So I like, like, like that in that type of atmosphere at that time, uh, you know, late in the game where, where we needed it and, uh, you know, people thought that the game was, our, you know, leaning towards Cardiff's side, like we were kind of out of the game. And um, no, it was definitely, uh, yeah, I think I might have blacked out, but I just remember thinking like how crazy the, uh, the, the noise was. And then, then Beauregard scores what turns out to be the game winner with about, I can't remember, 10 or 7 minutes left or something. That's the first time you take the lead in that game. How determined was that bench then to say, you know, that's, that this is it now? <laughs> This, this is the game. <laughs> yeah, I just remember we just wanted to play tight, tight around the net, you know, like no no loose plays, everyone, you know, pack it in, don't let Killer get any odd man rushes against or backdoor plays, just keep it in-house, play for each other. Uh, there was a lot of block shots, I remember, uh, down the stretch, and guys were putting their faces on the line, like they sliding everywhere just to just to help Killer out any way we could. And um yeah, it was, it was a, definitely, I remember it was a, you know, the fans just, they, they didn't stop cheering really from that 10 minute on. It was just a crazy, crazy atmosphere. Uh, was something, you know, I'll never forget. And it was awesome to win that game. And then talk me through the emotions when that Hooter goes and that game is finished. <laughs> yeah, it was just great. It was great seeing all the, uh, the guys, the, the guys from England win it in front of their families and, you know, some of the guys had kids like Danny Myers and David Clark, and just to see them able to um, celebrate um, in, you know, in front of the, all the fans that those fans, you know, they had such great relationships with those guys. You know, they were, they were, they were really more than fans to them. They were almost like a part of their family as well. So um, yeah, it was, it was more, I was, I was so happy, but I was, I was really happy for the, the local guys uh, that, you know, cause they helped, take us all under their wing and made us feel comfortable and would do anything. You know, if we needed a ride to the grocery store, if we needed a car, they were, you could ask any one of them and they'd, they'd drop whatever they were doing and help you out. So just to see them like David Clark, I remember climbing over the grass and lifting up the trophy. It was, I was just so proud for those guys. And you also get that really cool experience because you win it at home. You get to go on the balcony after the game with the fans all, all outside the arena. And that, that must be a pretty unique experience. Yeah, to see all the fans go outside. And it was a, I remember it was a beautiful day and uh, it was still light out and everyone just packed the, pad, the, the uh, patio and we got to go on the balcony and show, show them the, uh, the championship trophy and they were still going crazy. And, you know, we, we, we had the Bears going and we were celebrating up on the patio just – like uh, you know, a bunch of kids almost, but um, it was it was it was awesome. It was just a great great experience. I think you're allowed to act like kids when you win something like that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you mentioned before that you were looking to like, that that year. You played more games than you'd ever played before. What do you put that down to? Like, was Scott Pownall just that good of a physio? Like, I don't want to I don't want to grease his gears too much because he's still around and stuff. But was he just that good? <laughs> Yeah, the whole staff honestly was just great, you know, like from Scott to Goody and, you know, Corey and Gary Moran, even the management staff. So, you know, I can't say enough good things about them and whatever you needed, they they go out of their way to just make you feel comfortable. And um, yeah, I just think that as far as playing those games, you know, just I had all the resources to stay healthy and uh, took care of my body um, as best as I could. And you know, I just wanted to play as much as I could and win win as much as I could and just kind of get back on track. So, yeah, it was definitely the staff. I'll give credit, give a lot of credit to all those guys. You know, they they run, they run a great organization there. And, 
you know, anything I needed, it, it, it'd be there to help out. And obviously, you did use the, the Elite League is a, is a league that's growing in standard all the time, but it is a stepping stone back to North America to greater things in Europe. And obviously, you managed to go back to North America and get an AHL uh, deal with Lake Erie, I think. But you didn't play many. Did you? We, did you get injured there or something? Like why? Why did you get cut short there? Yeah, I went there on a tryout and I made the team. And then they got um, some guys back from the NHL, so I had to go down. And I was only supposed to go down for a, a couple of weeks, and I ended up breaking my jaw when I was in the East Coast League. Mm. So it ended up being a. Uh, I was in South Carolina for a long time, majority of the year, but I, I only played. I broke my jaw my first game down there. So I think I played 10 more games down there. And then Hershey called me up um, to finish the season with them. And did you know that you were, did you just had enough of like the grind of it all then? Or were you forced? Yeah, to the, in the, the whole thing, even getting back when I had the, the jaw, my, uh, my groin was hurting a lot. My hips were hurting. Um, I didn't want to keep doing the up and down stuff. And, um, you know, I just realistically, I knew my body couldn't play in the NHL and that was the goal. Um, you know, and I, I felt like anything short of that was going to be a failure regardless. So I wanted to try to work my way back into the NHL, um, in a different role. And I decided to do at first, I, I wanted to be, you know, do the coaching. So I got back in the coaching right away. And then, um, uh, and then I got an opportunity to start scouting with the Florida Panthers. So that I've been doing that for about six years. And I, I was going to mention that that is such a cool thing to be doing. Like you, you were a former Nottingham Panther, and now you're working for the Florida Panthers. There's, there's that synergy there. But yeah. how, how did that opportunity come around? Um, just from coaching, I, I went back and I was the assistant coach at the high school I coached at, like one of the best high schools in the in the country, Cushing Academy. And then after that, I got uh, offered to be a head coach of a junior team, the Boston Junior Bruins, they're called. And from that team, we had a lot of, um, we, you have to recruit kids to get them to play for your team. And, uh, I think we had five kids drafted off that team, which is wow. usually only about seven to 10 high school kids drafted in the country. So we had, we had five just off that team. So a lot of the caught the, a lot of the NHL teams were at every game. Um, and they would, and I, so I started building relationships with different NHL teams. And then actually I want us like three different teams, uh, you know, asked if I'd be interested in scouting and then, um, Florida gave me a good offer and, um, you know, I took it and I've been doing it ever since. So, so what does your day to day look like now though? It's a lot of travel. Um, <laughs> you know, I travel throughout the U S and build a draft list. So I, I have to, um, you know, me and a, a team of scouts, um, we I'm responsible for the guys in the U S with a couple other guys. And, uh, you know, we rate, we rank the draft eligibles, 18 to 20 year old players. And then we, we go and watch college, a lot of college games, college free agents, whoever didn't get drafted, but uh, late bloomers, uh, we look to sign them. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a lot of travel, a lot of game reports, a lot of meetings. Uh, but it's it's a lot of fun, and I've been fortunate enough to just, you know, everything's just about learning from great people. So I've had some – I've learned a lot from some great people. Dale Talon's been in, in the game for a long time. He was our former GM, but super smart, uh, great ma manager, and the way he will, deals with players and um, people is great. And guys like Chris Pronger and Brian McCabe, and, and now our new GM is one of the brightest guys I've ever been around, Bill Zito. So, uh, you know, it's a whole new crew right now, but uh, smart people. And I just try to learn every day. Is it a case of like when you go and watch these guys, you write your reports and you send them up to the GM and he makes his assessments from there based on that kind of thing? Is that, is that the system, how it works? Um, yeah, we have a director of uh, amateur scouting. So basically um, he's in charge. He's Shane Churler, really super smart guy. He's been a scout for, you know, 20, almost 20 something years. He played and he had a great career in the NHL. Um, so it goes up to him. Uh, we send in reports, goes up to him. Then we have, you know, weekly meetings. We rate guys, see where guys slot in if the draft was, you know, just getting ready for the NHL draft. And uh, as the season rolls on, we'll realize where we are in the standings. Uh, we'll start focusing on um, some guys to key in on that might be in the spot where we're picking or, you know, if we like other guys, should we do a trade up scenario and, 
Um, there's a lot of different things that goes into it. Um, so it's just behind the scenes. It's definitely um, fun to be a part of something that uh, you still have a chance to win a Stanley Cup. Stanley Cup. It's also like a way to, like you mentioned, like staying involved with the game, isn't it? Like it's been such a huge part of your life and for it to continue to be, it must be such a, a rush, a thrill for you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, hockey's been everything uh, with my family, you know, like my brother Mike played in the NHL. Um, you know, my father played in college. So we, we come from a hockey family, so I don't think I'd want to do anything outside of hockey. I don't think I would be good at doing anything outside of hockey. So uh, I want to make sure that, um, you know, stay in the game. And like I said, everything, everything right now is about winning a Stanley Cup. So if I can do, you know, just do my best to bring in the best pe- players to the Florida Panthers and help build a championship team, then my job is, uh, my, you know, I feel like I'd be successful at my job. And are you able to get out to games at the minute, you know, with the current state of everything? Or is it a lot of watching games online now? Um, it's both. Uh, the USHL, uh, the United States Hockey League, it's uh, the best junior league in the in the U.S. Uh, they're, they're actually playing. So that's one of the leagues that um, I'm responsible for. So I, I go out there and, you know, I was just in um, Iowa last weekend, Chicago, uh, Nebraska. So... I've been traveling, traveling around, um, you know, just being safe and washing my hands and as much as possible and wearing a mask. But um, yeah, that league's still going. There's some, some leagues around Boston still going. Uh, the colleges are all playing, but they're just not um, allowing scouts or fans in the building. So for those games, I'm watching a lot of video. And I'm guessing that it's a case of like, you need to do both anyway. So like you need to, to see a player in person is obviously different to watch them on a screen because the game's slower from where cameras are and stuff. But do you find, which way do you prefer to assess a player, like digitally or in person? I think you definitely need to see a player in person just because the, you know, the, the camera just follows the puck around. So you got to figure out what this guy's doing away from the puck, how his body language is, uh, how he interacts with his teammates, how he interacts with his coaches, uh, his behavioral tendencies on the bench, uh, his back checks, things like that that you'd never be able to see um, in a, on, on game tape. You know, once, once you see a guy live a few times and you, you have a good feel for his game, then I think watching video is very important and, um, you know, beneficial for trying to predict their potential. And how easy is it? Like, when you first start in as a scout, obviously you're going to watch, most of the time you'd be going to watch like one player or something. How, uh, when you first started, how, how much time does it take to adjust to be able to just watch one guy on the ice rather than getting distracted by everything that happens in a game of ice hockey? It's usually not one guy. Like You'd be surprised. Okay. You, you go to watch one guy, but then you end up liking another guy better. So you can't just watch one guy because there's so much going on. So you can just, just kind of take it, take it slow and just figure out what type of player he's going to be and, and – what he has in his game that's going to translate to make him a successful NHL player. So just, you're really just going to focus on uh, the tendencies, the decision-making, uh, decision-making under pressure, if they can make plays, if they can, um, you know, they're, they're skating with some of the tools, if it's going to translate and get them to such an elite level um, to play against the best players in the world. And obviously you said you've been, you've been involved with Florida for about six years or so. Are there any players that you've, that you've identified that you're proud of yourself for identifying? Yeah, but to be honest, it's, it's, it's all, it's teamwork. You know, it's like, uh, it would be like saying, you know, if you want a championship, you're not giving the credit to the rest of the team. It's, it's, uh, you can identify a guy and you're going to be, you're going to hit on some of them and you're going to miss on some of them. And so when you end up taking one, you, you take them as a group, you know, you can't just point the finger and say, Hey, that guy took this guy because, there's a lot of other guys that got behind you and, and supported you and watched hours, hundreds of hours of video. Um, there's an analytic team that, you know, that they, they did a lot of bet, a lot of work on going through his stats. Um, you know, a lot of interviews, the interview process is more than just one-on-one. We'll have a whole management interview and a kid to try to see what type of character he has. And if he has uh, what we think is going to win us at Stanley cup. So this, we, we've drafted some really good players as of late, um, guys that I'm definitely excited, super excited to see uh, five guys play in the World Junior Championships next week. 
Um, so, but it's really no one guy was my guy. Or one guy was someone else's guy. It's the Florida Panthers pick and it will always be like that. That's it's so fascinating to hear how that all works behind the scenes. Like you say, like it's all like you've got the team on the ice and the te- the off ice team, and it, and it really does sound like it's a team. And that's so fascinating to hear how all that comes together and how that works. Yeah, definitely, it's a it's a team, and it, it's so much work. You know, like making it to the NHL for a player is so hard, and they 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 have to accomplish so much on the ice, but they have to deal with a lot off the ice, and you have to make sure that the, the kids are. Uh, emotionally ready to take on, you know, dealing with the media, you know, being away from their family, um, you know, coming to the rink every day and outworking the guy next to them. You know, it's not like an office job where you can take some time off. Like you, you got to be performing at the top of your game, every game night, every practice, uh, every workout. So, you know, it, it, it takes a lot for the management to figure out who, who the right guys are. And, and that's what we've been trying to do. Well, I have no doubt that a ton of Panthers fans, like myself, who start, I started watching in 2010-11, like you were part of the first Panthers yeah. team I ever saw, are going to be very, first of all, pumped up to have heard from you again. I'm very excited that you're still involved in the game. But I do have one rule on this show, and that is that, the show, that, that it has to end on a laugh. So and you mentioned like there's plenty of stories from your time in Nottingham, like police almost having to get involved in Hull because Rob nearly started a brawl and stuff. But when you look back at your time in, in Nottingham in the Elite League, give me a story that makes you laugh. Oh, God. Uh, it was it's a, safe it was to a... tell because <laughs> I know hockey players have plenty that aren't. <laughs> uh, can't be about Penner then because those, uh, those are all X-rated. Oh, well, Gary's told me plenty of those ones, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> He's a great guy. Uh, I think one time... I told the guys uh, that Rob Bellamy had a, a phobia against snakes. And I think it was Steve Lee or someone, someone knew someone who had a snake and it was a big snake. And uh, Rob came in for practice and in our stalls, you lift up, you lift up your stall and you usually have like, I don't, you know, your tape or your socks, your underwear, or whatever. And, and, uh, Steve Lee put the snake in where you lift up the stall <laughs> and Bell's lifted it up and he put his hand, he put his hand in and the snake just like wrapped around him and he, he just lost it he, he ran out of the of the room ran down the hallway ran I think he was trying to get outside but like a door was locked and uh and everyone was in shock because they didn't realize he was going to panic like this so they're like, you got to go talk to him. You got to go talk to him. And he had tears in his eyes because he's really, as like a big, strong kid, he's deathly scared of snakes. So everyone sent me out there and I had to go. And, you know, I, they, they thought he was going to come in and stop beating people up. And uh, I had to take the blame for it. I said, I just told them. You had to, I didn't know that the snake was going to like attack you and try to, you know, wrap itself around your wrist like that. He's like, why would you do that to me? You know, this is the one thing. <laughs> And uh, it was it was hilarious, but he came back in and, and uh, you know everyone had to apologize to him and it was made you know it was, it was just one of the funniest things that you've seen you'll see in a locker room. What does Corey make of that when he sees this snake in there? <laughs> or did you do this before he got there? Before he saw? Yeah, it was early. I, I think he was just in his he was just in his lo- he was in his uh, office, and um, yeah, I remember walking in and like getting a text message before like hey. It, it, the snake's waiting for bells and I was like oh this is going to be great I didn't I didn't realize that he was going to be fishing around in there like I thought he'd just open and see it and next thing you know that the snake wraps itself around his wrist oh. <laughs> only in the elite <laughs> <But> that, <laughs> yeah. well that's the type of team we had we, uh, you know we were always playing little pranks on each other but you know nothing ever too serious and there was never any fights in the locker room it was always just a great group of guys and like the type of team, like I said, that you win a championship with. And that, that's where, when you mentioned like how close they were, that adversity you went through, you know, in December and January, that really brings you together as a group, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You can't, you know, if you go the whole year without any adversity, you think everything's going to come easy. Um, but when Killer, when Kill, Killer went down there, we knew that we definitely had to sharpen up on our DN, uh, D zone. Uh, we had to stop blocking more shots 
Um, you know, we couldn't just rely on Killer to make the big saves all the time. So once he did come back and then we, once we bought into uh, playing more defense for our style and, you know, more physical and just being tight with one each other, no, no holes in our game. And um, that's when I think everything really started started coming together and we knew that we were going to do some special things that year. And then when you, when you look, obviously, when you look back at your, t- your year in, in the Elite League as a whole, positive experience? Oh, yeah, it was, it was an unbelievable experience. Uh, it was, you know, something that I always think of one of the better decisions I've made in my life, uh, just meeting such great people and uh, getting to see that part of the world and play in front of such passionate fans and uh, being able to win and build lifelong friends with people from England and, um, you know, seeing those guys help grow the game in England and how successful Team GB has been because of that core group of guys that, I got to play with and um, you know it was just a it was a very positive experience and something that um, you know I was very happy I made the decision to to join the team. Well you mentioned the fans a, a couple of times throughout this. One of the big things about playing in Nottingham is Gary makes you work hard when you go to these player events and you get to know the fans who come out to them and that really helps you build that relationship with the fan base doesn't it because when you're going through that that tough stretch they're going through it with you because you're going up to Newcastle, you lose that game. There's still 200 Panthers fans who have, who have travelled up with you. So you do build a very close relationship with the fan base as a whole because of everything you do in Nottingham. Yeah, Gary does a great job at, at getting the guys out in the community. And, you know, like I said, and that helps, not only does it just help build the relationship, but it helps grow the game. You know, you, you meet a lot of the young kids that are getting into hockey and they, they don't, you know, they, you're like an NHL player to them and, um, yeah, he's, he's, he does a great job with the, you know, the skate with the fans and Jersey signings and, you know, restaurant, uh, you know, the stuff at all the restaurants and in the area and, um, you know, all the billboards, even up in the, you know, the Nottingham up throughout the city and signs and windows and he, the marketing he does and, and everything's great. And, uh, you know, it all comes back to just having a passionate fan, fan base and, in a group of guys that's willing to, uh, you know, accept the, the role of being a role model and, and playing for the fans and for the city. And I think that's what they've always had a great group of guys to do that. Well, I cannot thank you enough for being so generous with your time today. This has been, this is one of my favorite seasons to talk about. So I always love any chance to go back and talk about it, especially with people who are involved. So thank you so much for this. Hey, no problem. Thank you, Daniel. And tell everyone in Nottingham I said hello. I will do, and I'll tell them you didn't throw your back out shoveling snow. (laughs) All right, I'll see you. Do what you do in the comfort of your own home, knowing that the things most precious to you are protected. Talk to the Nottingham Building Society today about a free home insurance review. Happy dancing.